Good afternoon, Eduardo. This is Ed Reether in the Boston area and Peter Malakoff in Mexico. And this is our second discussion. Uh, we had a discussion last week at, uh, about Peter's work and writings. And for those who missed the first one, you could see it on B-Zone. But this is a follow-up because a lot of the people that watched your first interview or discussion really became interested in the work that you've been doing now with Ayurveda, the Indian medicine technology or method of healing people and working with people, and of which you're a practitioner now that I believe in, uh, have been for many years. Mm -hmm. 15 years. 15 years. And so one of the things that I wanted to start with was how you became um, interested in Ayurveda methods or practice. Uh, what brought you into the practice of Ayurveda medicine? Suffering. Suffering. <laughs> ah, the good Buddhist way. I um. <clears throat> I formally entered into the realm of Vedic studies at the direction of Maharishi, who told me to do that. And, and so for those who don't know Maharishi, you're referring to Maharishi Mahash Yogi. Yogi, who brought transcendental meditation Transcendent. to the West, who was the disciple of Brahmananda Saraswati, who was a Shankaracharya, which is kind of like a pope in India, of the, one of the Shankara Maths, the northernmost, the Math that rules them all. It's a, it's a unique, uh, there's four and of them I, in the four I, corners. I, I wanted to ask you about Maharishi, and didn't he have an influence? Didn't you also have some kidney issues when you were with him in Mallorca, Spain? In 1972, this date I remember. Uh, I was in Mallorca, Spain. It, it was an eight-month meditation course. A lot of the people were med like myself were meditating 15, sometimes 20 hours a day. We would see Maharishi in the evenings only. And I didn't move for long periods of time. Maharishi said you do this thing called rounding where you meditate. Then after an hour you do asanas. Then after an hour, then you do um, pranayama. And then you meditate again. It's called a, that was one round. But me, I was in, I was having ascended type experiences and I was not going to move. <laughs> you know, I didn't care what he said. And I came down with serious kidney disease. I mean, I'm not sure, you know, I had also changed my diet from raw foods and vegetables to a macrobiotic diet. And I was using a lot of salt at the time. And I was also relatively immobile for long periods of time. So I came down with kidney disease. I went to the course doctors. I was diagnosed. You have nephritis. It is serious. Uh, we might have to take out your kidneys, but don't worry. We can put you on a kidney dialysis machine and then we can get a transplant. And I went to another doctor and he told me the same thing. So I didn't know what to do. And I I went to see Mar. I had a dream in which a woman appeared to me and said, you're not hungry, don't eat. So with that, I didn't pay that much attention to it. It was interesting. Anyway, I went to see Marishi. I got in to see him around two or three in the morning. People would often wait outside his door. There were, there were people who looked after him that were, but he would see people. So I got in to see him. I told him, Marishi, I have nephritis. You know, the course doctors say I have to leave the course. I have to get my uh, get treatment. They would suggest removing my kidneys. And uh, he said, what would your mother say to do? That's what Marishi was the first question he asked me outside of what's going on. And I said, well, my mother believes in fasting. 
And then this this dream I had had came up where the woman said, you're not hungry, don't eat. And Maharishi said, then you should fast. So I began a fast in Mallorca, Spain, and the course moved to Fuji, Italy, but I continued to fast. I flew to England, to uh, uh, Heathrow Airport in London, because I was going to go to a fasting institute run by this man called Keki Sidwa, Dr. Keki Sidwa, who was a Parsi, who had a castle on the east coast of England on the channel. And, uh, but I didn't know where or how to get there. And I was in Heathrow Airport and uh, I went into the phone booth there. I was already been fasting for 10 days. So I was kind of weak. And I tried to make a call and I couldn't find out where this guy was. And a man came up and he says, can I help you? And I said, well, I'm just looking for somebody. He said, no, 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 can I help you? And I said, well, I'm looking for uh, this man. He said, well, what's his name? And I said, his name is Dr. Keki Sidboy. He says, oh, Keki, he says, you've come to fast. This is in Heathrow Airport. So he takes me, you know, and we go across town on a taxi and we get on a train and we go out to Fritton on Sea. And on the way out there, uh, we passed a bookstore and I felt I was going to be up for a long fast. And I went in there and I bought the gospel of Sri Ramakrishna. I mean, out of all these books, I didn't know much about Ramakrishna at that time, which greatly influenced me. So anyway, I continued to fast for 43 days. I jokingly, jokingly tell people, I don't know why they make such a big deal about Jesus. He only did 40 days, <laughs> but, but that's a joke. And um, on the 40th day, I had huge swellings in my mastoid glands, huge. And Keki Sidwa was afraid that I was gonna die because those glands are on both sides of the blood-brain barrier. So he called in local MDs, you know, regular doctors to see me just so he was like, you know, off the hook in case I died. You know, they go, oh my God, you haven't eaten for 40 days. This is terrible. You know, we have to uh, get you to the hospital right away, intravenous feeding. But in England at that time, at least, you could decide your fate, unlike in America where they, you know, you have to do this. So I told them no. They told me, you know, you're going to die, son. You know, this is serious. I stayed with my decision. They walked out the door. As soon as they walked out the door, these burst inside my mouth as soon as the door clicked. And they drained. They drained for a whole day. I spent two more days in fasting, and on the third day, oh, I woke up, I was in radiant health. I tell this story because when you fast, when you eliminate, symptoms come up. Those symptoms are not indicative of a sickness necessarily. Those symptoms, they can be, but they are can also be indicative of an eliminative crisis. And after 40 days of not eating, that's what was coming out my body. I had a lot of dental work done. So after the fast, I was clairvoyant and I was clairaudient. And that went on for a period of time, no longer. I mean, it didn't last very long, but I was in a radiant state of health. But that didn't bring me to Ayurveda. That's about the fasting. At that time, I, I believed in eating you know, raw foods, natural foods, I went back to the raw food diet. I left macrobiotics and later integrated that more. So Did you, you go asked back to Maharishi? It? Yes. Well, I went home. I thought I was enlightened. <laughs> well, you were kind of enlightened. I was like, I was cheap, cheap, cheap thrills. You know, it's like it was well, enough for me. You had um, something going on. So I went back to the United States and uh, over a period of around three, four weeks, I realized that, you know, I woke up and that state of infatuation, intoxication was no longer there. And I realized I had been fooling myself and I flew to Fuji. Well, I flew to Italy, Rome, and went to the course and finished the course in Fuji. So. So also your, um, your work, I want to jump now because you, you went to uh, Sanskrit University in India to actually train under uh, Ayurveda uh, yes. uh, uh, a practitioner at some point in time. 
So you were certified, which gives you the certification to teach or do. Yeah, I went to I went to Kalidas Sanskrit University, specifically to study with uh, Dr. Sunil Joshi. And uh, I was either going to study with Joshi or Ladd, Dr. Ladd, Vasant Ladd, who's in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Um, but I noticed in Joshi's book, which I read, because um, I was fascinated with Ayurveda yeah. now. And uh, Joshi had dedicated the book to Maharishi, who Maharishi was responsible for initially bringing uh, Ayurveda uh, to the West formally. And so that was really a big deal to me. Right. And so I, I went that way. I think they're both fantastic teachers. And but that's why I went there. So he was teaching at Kalidas Sanskrit University. And so I went out there to finish a two year course where I got a degree in Ayurveda. It's not a full four year course. It's a two year course. So in 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 um, in, uh, in India. In the, it started in America and then went to India. Yes, it's a karmic right. Right. aspect. On, on my very first day of Ayurveda College in Nagpur, Maharashtra, in India, the head of the whole uh, school, as I remember, came in to address everybody, and he said, "Everything in the world, without exception, everything is medicinal." Yeah, absolutely everything, absolutely everything is medicinal and absolutely everything in the world is poisonous. Absolutely everything and Ayurveda will teach you to tell the difference between the two. So when I got a heart attack, when I got all these problems, I had actually become perverted in my dietary cravings towards exactly the things that I shouldn't have, which is the single most common thing that I've discovered as a practitioner when you know, seeing people all over, is that people are addicted exactly to the things they shouldn't have, even though I thought I was eating a very healthy diet. So Ayurveda is a science that is, it, it, it's like inherent in the nature of life. It was not, it was discovered, it was not, invented and it is the science of life Ayur is life veda is the science or knowledge of and it's about understanding a person's makeup elementally in terms of the five elements in terms of their season of their life in terms of where they live in terms of uh, uh, what they eat what they don't eat what kind of work they have all these things, what was the genetic makeup of their parents, what kind of diseases ran in their family. It goes on and on and on. Sometimes people are eating good food, but it's in bad combinations. So it's, it's, a, it's a very thorough uh, consideration of life and how to balance life and how to tell what is good and what is bad, what is healthy, what will balance this person and this will imbalance the person. And it takes into account that people can become perverted or confused or ignorant in their choices. And that is the single most uh, consistent and amazing thing that I've discovered as a practitioner. Is that people are, when I first started practicing in San Francisco, I'd go to people's houses. I didn't have an office then. And I'd say, can I go into your cupboards and look in your refrigerator? And they said, sure. Adios, Lily. Bye. They, they would, um, and I would tell just by looking at what they were eating, most probably, in most cases, what was going on with them. All right. And so one has to, it's, it's subtle, it's, it's clear, it's principled, it's scientific, and it's also subtle. One of the things they didn't teach in Ayurveda College, which I would always raise my hand and say, hey, what about this, was the science of omens. Of what? Omens. Omens. Signs in nature. Right. There's like books on this. I mean, in the, in the classical treatises, you know, if your person comes to see you and they see a cow walking from right to left or this kind of animal or that, 
These are all indicative. You see, Western medicine is based on omens. Western medicine. In other words, they, they do a chart, they do a test, they say, this is a, I see a sign here of something. Well, Ayurveda did the same thing. When I do a pulse, when somebody does a pulse, when you, there's a whole bunch of things, the way a person talks, the way they walk, the way the speed at which they talk, their skin, their, their body type, you know, all sorts of things are omens and indicative of what is going on or what is not going on. So it's an amazing uh, science. It's a Vedic science, and it's meant for the simple purposes of maintaining the health of the healthy and uh, getting rid of the disease of the unhealthy. And it does it by a different approach to the law of karma than Western medicine. Western medicine says, oh, you got arthritis in the knees. You know, I, I'm living here. There's a lot of older people here, Westerners. Arthritis is really common. And, you know, they have knee replacements. I'm like, well, this is crazy. What caused that? that that uh, arthritic condition there can and can it be reversed yes i mean not not right away but it's it's a far more effective less expensive and benign way to deal with disease which is remove the cause not the symptom if the oil light goes on you don't surgically remove the oil light you go, you stop the car, you go into the engine, you do something, you know, with oil, with the engine. All right, all right. So Western medicine has a different approach to the law of karma itself. It says we can get rid of the symptoms. You know, you give you a knee replacement, a new liver, new kidneys. See, it's a whole different worldview, right. profoundly different. And so studying Ayurveda was like a, a reconsideration of so many things in the Vedic culture I study mainly the philosophy, the religion, the, the stories, the you know Puranas, all that. But this is the same science, the same teaching in a different consideration, just looking at a different part of the sky. Right. How can anybody comprehend the multi-dimensional? Here's how. Here's how a beginning. I'll, I'll integrate Ayurveda the Vedic tradition and COVID. In the Ayurvedic scriptures from five, 10,000 years ago, it depends on which scholars you're talking to. A pandemic occurs when the government, when the king is corrupt. I don't have to put that together for you, do I? <laughs> That's when a pandemic occurs. When the government, when the rule is is corrupt, the, then then it manifests. In the so, how would I talk about the Mahabharata? This Mahabharata is the biggest epic in the world. It's like an Encyclopedia Britannica in size, the full Mahabharata. And one small little sliver of that encyclopedia is the Bhagavad Gita, which most people are familiar with. It's not the only Gita in the Mahabharata, it's, but it's, this whole thing was composed by Veda, who they called Veda Vyasa, Vyasa, this great sage. In the Bhagavad Gita, where Krishna comes out on a battlefield as a charioteer for his friend and devotee, Arjuna, Arjuna says, drive me out on the battlefield so I can see with whom we have to fight. And Krishna drives him out there and says, behold, the assembled car of us, the bad guys out there. Behold all these guys, our enemy. And Arjuna looks and instead of seeing the evil and the, the Waps and the Japs and the, the Germans, he sees sons and grandsons and grandfathers. His vision is colored. And he goes, you know, how can I fight with these people? I, I, these are people, some of whom I love. And, you know, he refuses to fight. He puts down his bow and arrow, his famous bow, the Gandhava. And he sits down on the chariot and he says, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm confused. I don't know what to do. And out of that situation comes the Gita. That war 
that they enge then engaged in. I'm not going to go deeply into the Gita here. Krishna told Arjuna, told the good guys, the Pandavas, if you do not cheat, if you do not deceive in this battle, you will lose. There's a situation where the great Drona, who's the teacher of both sides in martial arts, who could not be defeated, and he, Arjuna couldn't defeat him, he couldn't defeat Arjuna. And he, but he was wiping out the good guy's forces. And so one night around the campfire, Krishna says, you know, there's only one way that we can defeat him. His only weakness, this great warrior Drona, this great teacher is his son, Ashvarma. If we could do something to Ashvarma, but we can't because he's hidden far beyond the lines. Everybody knows that's his weakness if anything happened to him. But if the eldest of the good guys, Arjuna's older brother, Pant Yudhishthira, if he was to go before Drona and he was to say, Ashvatama has been killed, Drona will sit back, put down his weapons, and Arjuna can kill him. Somebody can kill him. And they, they say, yeah, but who's he going to believe? <laughs> There's only one person Krishna says he'll believe. Yudhishthir, the eldest, the son of Dharma, never told a lie, always righteous, absolutely upholder of Dharma. Yudhishthir, Yudhishthir has to say it. And they come to Yudhishthir, he says, I can't do that, I'm not going to lie. You, you don't lie, we're all going to get wiped out. We're all going to get killed. Drone is going to wipe out our army. You have to do it. And Yudhishthir is like, I, I, I can't lie. And, so you, Krishna says, here's what we're going to do. We're going to christen an elephant, Ashvatama. Then we're going to kill it. And then you're going to go out there and you're going to say, Ashvatama has been killed. So, now Drona was a righteous man, but he had to fight on the side of evil because of uh, obligations. Uh, they were kshatriyas, they were warriors. So anyway, they tell this is how we'll do it. Yudhishthira and Yudhishthira is like, <laughs> okay. But Krishna knows they do this. They christen an elephant, Ashwatam, and they kill it. Then you, they, they drive Yudhishthira out in the chariot in front of Drona. And Krishna knows that Yudhishthira is not going to go through it. And what Yudhishthira goes out and he says, you know, he honors Drona. And he says, Ashwatama. And then under his breath, at the same time, Krishna tells everybody to play drums really loudly. The elephant, Ashvatama, the elephant, has been killed. But he doesn't hear the elephant because they were playing the drums. And he puts down his weapons and he's killed. You see that again and again in the Mahabharata, in this battle. And people think, you know, uh, Krishna is complete nobility, righteousness, truthfulness. He's, he says on many occasions, if we did not do this, we would have lost. And that is the relevance of a, the Mahabharata, a single story out of it for this day and age. And what you see happening in America, or what I feel is happening in America today, in which we're complete unrighteousness, people who are adharmic, not righteous, how do you deal with that? Like Gandhi did? See, I don't think so. My parents were followers of Gandhi. I don't think so. So that's an example of how the Mahabharata and these great stories, it's said of the Mahabharata, if it isn't in the Mahabharata, it isn't. <laughs> it's such a vast consideration of life and the play of life and all the qualities and all the situations a person can get into and politically, individually, socially, marriage, everything. It's just incredible book, incredible. It's the longest epic in the world. But, and, and, and so if I were going to apply a kind of Ken Wilber point of view on the scheme of this is that these are mythic 
kind of stories. These are archetypal stories. These are universal crises that the human individual or collective individuals have, has to deal with. It's life and death. It's how do you deal with the good and the evil? How do you work out injustices? How do you work out people who are suffering and those who are not suffering and can help? Or how do you work with people who are deceptive and deceiving and evil and do wrong? These are mythical and universal questions in every culture and the Mahabharata has been an exquisite architecture of these kinds of stories, right? You see in the in the Ramayana, you know, I just wrote this book, the Hanuman story for Ramdas, which is from the Ramayana, Ramayana. In the Ramayana, that's how people pronounce it out here. In the Ramayana, uh, it's pretty much straightforward. You know, Rama is noble, you know, good, always dharmic. There's a few incidents, like when he kills the great monkey Vali by shooting him in the back. There's a few things that are debated. But the Mahabharata is filled with paradox and dilemma. And much, you see, if you haven't seen it, if you haven't learned it, you haven't learned to recognize it, it people are uneducated in these kind of things, haven't considered them. So it's important. I, I've never read a book so comprehensive as the Mahabharata. And of course, the Mahabharata in India, there's a huge, massive, vast uh, oral tradition that surrounds it and thousands of years of commentary on it, thousands. So, you know, what we have in the West, you know, th this or that translation is a small section, small slice of that pie. But always the word of the realizer the word of the guru is what is one of is the main form of instruction. Uh, not these guys are not mythic, you know. Oh, I'm going to write this story kind of thing. They're recorders of this story. Did I tell you about the most? <laughs> you stop me if you don't want me to do this. So one story leads to another. The most single most amazing thing that I experienced in India. Would you like to hear that? Yes. OK. My roommate in Ayurveda College, a man called Antoine, uh, he had been in India before me. He used to live in Goa. He was a, a real wild character. Um, but he was my roommate. We lived in a hospital, Ayurvedic hospital. And um, he told me, he says, there's these people that you can go to and you give them your thumbprint. I did it. And they told me my father's name, my mother's name, my name, my you know, just off my thumbprint, who my brother was, all this stuff. He says it was the most amazing thing. So, you know, he was kind of a wild character. I just thought, I didn't think it was going to be true, but I, it was one of the first things I did when I graduated from Ayurveda College. I went to Old Delhi and I went up to this place, this nondescript place, and they had all these palm leaf manuscripts piled up against the wall and a bunch of people waiting, predominantly uh, Indians, but there were a few white people, to see somebody who would take your thumbprint. So they took my thumbprint and they said, come back in a day. I didn't tell my name or birth date or anything like that. So I come back the next day and I am shown into a small room and the guy's sitting on a desk and he has all these palm leaf manuscripts that you know are piled all over around this place. And he starts to look at them. And he opens, the, you know, there's a board, you, you flip them open and there's written on a palm leaf. And he says, is your mother's name? I had my own translator, which I had picked up on the street. I was told to do that. So the guy didn't know anything about what I was doing because they spoke Tamil. I'm up in northern India, so it's it's Hindi up there predominantly. So anyway, 
I just won't bother with the translator. They they spoke. It was being translated to me, and they said, "Does your mother's name begin with a G? No. Does your father's name begin with an F? No. You know, it just goes on and on. You know, are you is your father in the plumbing business? No. You know, and each time they put that book away, take out another one. They had a set number. So anyway, they got. You know, I thought two and a half hours had gone by. I thought they're not going to find my leaf. Antoine was probably lying. And uh, they flip over. And they, Is your mother's name begin with an M? Yes, big deal. <laughs> After two and a half hours, yes, it begins with an M. Is her name Marguerite? It was Marjorie. I said yes. Is her middle name Martha? I just stood up. I said because I felt something was about to happen. And I said, I, I, I want to take a picture of this. I didn't want to go any further. I want to take a picture. Maybe they're reading my mind. This is India. My God, who knows what the hell is going on here? Uh, we don't allow pictures. I insist I have to take a picture. So they called in the guru of the whole place, an older older guy, and he, he looked at my leaves. He flipped them over. He says, he can take a picture. So I took a picture. What I'm going to tell you now is independently translated. In the, what they were translating was ancient Tamil, which had been translated out of Sanskrit around thousand years ago. These leaves were a thousand at least, or thousands of years old. So he said, I'd take a picture. So they said, uh, is your mother's name Marjorie, Martha? Is your father's name Norman? This is your leaf. And then they, they started to tell me all this stuff about myself when I was born what my name was, what I was interested in, all about this life. Then they told me all about my past life, you know, which who knows? It was it was benign, but it, who knows? And usually for a people person, they will tell you about your future life. Uh, it was the biggest smack in the face of free will that I have ever gotten. I mean, how could this be? How could this be written down thousands of years ago? Where, what I thought I am controlling my life, you know, apparently not very much. They say that up to the point of that reading, these are called the Nadi, Nadi readers, like Gandhi had his done, told him about his assassination. Uh, Deepak Chopra, these are just, few famous people that people will know a lot of people and um and there's a lot of scams out there too all right okay so you, you want you don't you, all you give is a thumbprint or they also can do it by measuring your shadow god knows how that's done i have no idea but it's the biggest smack in the face of free will and it was it was like meeting adi da it completely took my legs out from under me and I didn't know what to think. I didn't, you know, everything was fluid, became fluid and without ground. So I went to, I wanted to go to the grand library of all the Nadi leaves. The British burned 60% of them because this is obviously the work of the devil. Right. <laughs> to them. And so I, I, that caused me to travel down to South India. The, uh, the Nadi leaves were in a town in South India, in Tamil Nadu. And it was there, I was on my way there and I stopped off at Kanchipur, uh, not Kanchipur, um, Mamalapur in Tamil Nadu on the coast uh, to watch the Indian National Festival of Dance. And after one night, the next night, it was the end of December, uh, the tidal wave came in. I was on the second floor. People were trapped downstairs in their rooms. The, tsunami, the great tsunami. The great tsunami. I was there for that. Well, I've got one more little part of it. Well, let me let, before you go further, because I want to get a sense from a um, from, because we're so physically based in the West. We're so mentally understanding history from, you know, the Egyptians or Sumerian culture and whatever, and India is way off somewhere in the distance, and we don't really, it is so far removed from the sense of what we understand history to be. 
and we are so scientifically based today based on genetics and now genomes and coded information and stuff like that is and and only science speaks of nano worlds or worlds that we can't see and only now these kinds of the little bit of information or understanding I have of the East is that there are subtle dimensions. There are dimensions that are far more refined, more invisible, that are outside of our bandwidth of what we can conceive with our brain mind that we usually associate reality with. And only now these kinds of unknown worlds of information that can be given into this world that we don't understand it it just shows our limitations the west is talking quantum mechanics and we in the west are still driving cars and smoking cigarettes and living the life of football and baseball and sports and what's the latest fashion. I mean, we have a very narrowly defined sense of reality. And there are so many things that you've addressed that we have just put to the side, whether it be death or sickness or your mother's grandfather that you did, who couldn't talk about the world that he grew up in Poland in 1938 when the Germans came in you know there's so many hidden and and part of the the diseases that people have are diseases of secrets diseases of unconscious material that they don't want to look at to inspect so to bring in the Mahabharata, to bring in the palm leaves, to bring in the these other realms, they're so outside of our, as the British would have done, this is the work of the devil. We have a very good, bad, and limited point of view in the West. And only now that these kinds of realities after the 60s, I guess, culturally it got integrated into the world of of uh, the young people of where we grew up, that this was was quite we were we were almost literate with it without being literate without being an educated because of the various methodologies and substances and, and practices that were available to us when we were young and impressionable people. So it's only now that it's becoming somehow integrated. I mean, it somehow, go ahead. Uh, it just takes about 50 to 75 years for any of this stuff to be integrated into what would be Christianity and scientific materialism. When I was uh, in Mamalapuram and the tsunami happened, I was, I was on the second floor, I was going to jump in get swept inland instead of being trapped in my room like the people downstairs. But then I noticed it started to it stop and then it went out again. So an hour later I went out and photographed. I took a lot of photographs. So anyway, I went into town. Mamalapuram is the site on the uh, east coast of India in Tamil Nadu of the oldest temple in all of India. It's called the Shore Temple. The oldest one. And it's built so close to the ocean that at high tide. I'm addressing your, what you just said, by the way. <laughs> I know it sounds like I'm. At high tide, waves come up into it. This is an old stone temple. And the Portuguese and the French and the British all like, what dumbasses the Indians are to build a temple so close to the ocean? I mean, how stupid can you get? So I went down into that area, uh, town after the first wave, there were three waves that came in, but the ocean goes out way far out, goes out half mile, three quarter mile out before the wave came in again, over a period of an hour. And so I went down there and 
there I went down to the shore temple. And I'm standing there and offshore from the shore temple was a huge temple complex that was underneath the water. They didn't build just, I mean, it's the ruins of it, but it's there, it's clearly there. They didn't build this next to the ocean. They built this on a hill. And it's all that is left of this once ancient civilization. And that is the metaphor for how things are not noticed or dismissed easily. Dumb, dumb Indians <laughs> build so close to the ocean. So that's happening, but it's not necessary, although it is valuable and helpful because it expands our consideration and reveals our ignorance, which is the basis of you know, true uh, absorption and understanding in life, not on the basis of I'm um, some brilliant genius, but on the basis right. of profound ignorance, a recognition of that consciously. And talking about ancient civilizations, Oppenheimer, Robert Oppenheimer, who was the uh, director of the atomic bomb project, he, when he saw the first flash of the first explosion of the atomic bomb, he uh, he gave a quote from the Bhagavad Gita. Did you know about that? Yes, I did. He said, now I'm become death, the destroyer of all the worlds. This is when Krishna revealed his universal form to Arjuna. And Oppenheimer said clearly that the Indians had atomic weaponry. Astras, they were called the atomic weapon. We'd be called the Brahmastra, Brahma, Brahma Astra. And they used them and they could counter them. And they had Vimanas, which were flying chariots. And when you think of the quality of life in America, for instance, it's very low. We have technology. <laughs> But with it, we've destroyed our environment profoundly and profoundly quickly. Over 95% of the large fish in the seas are gone. Right. So, there was a lot around in those old times. And it's important also, I believe, Ed, to point out that it's not important, the subtle realms particularly, any more than the gross realms. It's not it's not a realm that is like that's where it's at. People familiar in the ancient scriptures with the subtle realms and the ability to engage them and use them to their own advantage. Um, also got into trouble. <laughs> well, it, it is interesting because you do have to acknowledge that there is an existence of these subtle realms. And one of the things that Adida was asked one time, he said, well, why do good people suffer so poorly and so many bad people are given so many gifts of wealth and they look like they're having a good time? And he said, well, that's because these, what you see here is on the lowest end of the spectrum of possibilities, if you will. And that if you were going to do good, the effect of that goodness is actually occurring on levels that you're not even cognizant of. You're as well, as well, not instead of, but as well. There's a famous story in the Indian Puranas of a man is walking along a, uh, Indian, a road, or a jungle path to see his guru. He's going to the temple to see his guru. He's a really good man, noble man, practitioner. He's walking along a path, he steps on a thorn, goes up the hill, gets another thorn to take out the thorn. This is a traditional metaphor you see a lot in Indian culture. Anyway, he's sitting there up on the hill, you know, getting out the thorn out of his foot, and he sees the worst guy in the whole village. Evil guy, deceitful guy, liar, cheat, you know, everything. Walking along the same path. He doesn't see him up on the hill. And he stops just about right where he got that thorn in his foot. And he looks down and he brushes aside the dirt. He digs a little. He takes out a box. He opens it. It's filled with gold coins. And he goes, holy shit. You know, I got a thorn in my foot. This guy got a little box of gold coins. 
So anyways, when he gets to his guru, he tells him the story, you know, the thorn, the foot, and the other guy with the gold. Everybody knows who the bad guy is. He said, how did this happen? I've been a practitioner. I've been, you know, this and that. How did this happen? The guru sits, he says, in, your, in his last life, this man, was, because of acts that he did, was destined to have a great fortune in this life. And all he got was a small box of gold coins. And in your life, you were destined to have terrible things happen to you in this life. But because of your practice and your engagement in good and dharmic action, all you got was a thorn in the foot. So I think that that's, that was uh, told, that story was told by Sri Ramakrishna. And he used to teach through parables and, and teachings, predominantly. And uh, so it's important, I believe, to also emphasize that the actions that we do in this life, it's not just the karma is mis- change things in this life. They may not give you a gold box of coins. You may get a thorn in the foot and you may not understand why. All right. But the actions that we do, the karmas we do make a difference. They don't, karmas cannot bring about realization. That's Shankar's famous words that knowledge alone destroys ignorance, not action. But knowledge uh, can be uh, shaded, shaded heavily, like you see in the one of the major parties in the United States today. You know, it's just you're very confused people. Very confused. Well, you know, we could get in more involved with this because what we're speaking about, and Arida speaks about it as the um, click clack machine of mutuality and uh, the duality of uh, the cosmic nature of the world and the world in the bigger sense of the world, of the worlds that we can see, what we're speaking about. And the whole point of this, um, the whole point of this whole understanding or awakening is about transcendence, not the obviation of anything, but the transcendence of the duality of these kinds of differences and good and bad and up and down and in and out and worlds and not worlds and all of these other things. And so maybe I'm, of course, I'm looking at the time that maybe next time we could talk a little bit more in depth about how to integrate these kinds of stories, mythologies, understandings, palm relief, um, the health, well-being, you know, bring in more of this uh, discussion and to focus in on some more of these uh, points that we've, we've brushed on, just briefly brushed on. Happy to do so. I've got a story for everything. Yeah? <laughs> and even that one, I don't know why I have a story for that too. Well, I'm sure as you are a, a, a prolific writer and also you have a mind that just is alive in this kind of dimension. It's just always an instruction to the transcendental nature of what it is, because this is just winds up, winds up to be a play. It rounds up to be a continual mix of opposites that you're alive, I'm alive, and we understand that there's a larger matrix to this phenomenon that we are pl- part of. And so it's always it's always on the table. There's, there's only one game happening, although it looks like there's lots of games, whether it's the Boston against New England or <laughs> Buffalo against whoever. You know, it's all the same game, and that the refinement of that game and the way in which you play that game really has an effect on not only you and your intimates and the people around you, but the world itself. So when you're speaking about the ocean being empty of fish, I know it firsthand because this is a fishing village, Mm. right? 
and what used to be here 30 years ago where I'm looking out the window and I can see, you know, 30 or 40 shrimp boats. There were 300 shrimp boats out there uh. 20 years ago. Now it's just a dwindling and a dwindling and a dwindling. The resources have been depleted. The oceans have been decimated of their livelihood. People have to go out 35 miles to get what they used to get in two miles. See, the in every age, the Dharma is different in the Indian tradition. The Dharma of a Satyuga, a pure ages is very different than the dharmas to be engaged in the Kali Yuga or the Treta Yuga or the Dwarpa Yuga. The, the, each of the Yugas has their own dharma, their own avatar, their own or avatars and their own dharma. And a lot of people coming in contact with the high teachings of a particular teacher in the past, like a Krishna, There's a universal, what they call Sanatna Dharma, eternal Dharma, that's at the essence of it. But there's also a Yuga Dharma, a Dharma of that Yuga. And we find ourselves in a very dark place in time, in the vast expanses of time in which man is living. And so it's an interesting consideration. What is the appropriate Dharma? How to deal with negativity right. and you know it's it's very subtle it's not like a clear like do this yeah, 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 yeah but it's good to know it's like that movie sophie's choice the choice that was given it's good to know there's unchoosable choices and it's we want to prevent that as much as possible that's what teaching, learning, knowledge, what you're doing with B-Zone. It's all to make intelligent choices, to know what to eat with the mind, with the attention, and what not to eat. Both. You need to know not just do this, but don't do that. <laughs> well, I was, so I would like to just say we've been speaking for a long period of time. I know we've been all over the place with a lot of the discussion, but I th what, what we're painting a broad picture here and I want to continue the discussion because I find our conversation to be lively and interesting to me. And uh, I, I hope the uh, people who are watching and listening also find it of interest and beneficial. And if they want, they wanted me to address other issues or you do, just let me know because I, okay. I I can carve out any slice of the pie. Right. There's there's a big pie out there. <laughs> so I'll post your website on the end of this video so people who want to get in touch with you can do so. And uh, if they stay tuned, I'm sure in the next week we will get together and have another discussion on topics that are of the same nature. Sounds good, Ed. I'm a cow wanting to be milked. All right, we'll go grab one of those titties next time. <laughs> oh, very good. Thank you, Ed. Thank you for the, the, the chance to talk. I appreciate it. All right, I enjoyed it also. Have a good day and we'll keep in touch. Okay, sounds good.